It's a good day to be able to be together to know that God is able to be pleased with what man offers to him. That's an awesome thought and one that should fill us with deep humility in knowing that our God wants to be approached by his creation. He desires to be approached by his creation. And that as we offer our worship to God, it can indeed be a sweet-smelling aroma from his creation to, the, to, his, to their creator. And so we appreciate not only your presence, but also your participation this morning. Called by God. You've probably heard people talk about being called before. And it's used a, a lot of, in a lot of different ways in the religious world. There are people who seem to have a, a mystical idea attached to it, that they were called in some mystical way through a dream or a certain event that happened to them or a strong sense that God was pulling them in a certain direction so they felt called. Or maybe a person feels like they were called to be a, a preacher or a teacher or something else because they have a strong inclination that maybe they were born with, that they fit that vocation very well. And so other people may even look at them and say they seem to be called to that certain line of business. People use it to talk about um, the way in which we feel or desire that if it's something that I want, then it's obviously something that God is calling me with because it's a desire that he's placed within me. And so this morning, I want us to talk about what this word called means in the biblical sense and to understand that we have all been called. And that is a, a biblical pr principle and concept that we'll see. We even see it in these verses that Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that Paul talks about a holy calling that was extended. He points out in a very specific way that he himself in verse 11 and 12 that he was appointed to be something special as a preacher, teacher, ambassador, if you will, to the Gentiles. And that Timothy had been selected as well to be a preacher and a teacher. He had been called, but not in the same sense in which we see the religious world talking about it. But we do have to understand exactly why this is an important concept. Our uh, theme for this year has been taking time to be holy. And if we're going to be holy people, we need to understand what is that calling, because this is described as a holy calling that's been directed toward all of mankind. And it was a calling that was predetermined that it was going to be made before time even began, that God was going to make this holy calling to all of creation. So we're going to be studying those things this morning. So if you're ready for your three words, let's see your the notebook's real high this morning. All right, very good. Your three words this morning are invitation, summons, and purpose. All three of these words are very important when we think about the concept of what it means to be called and what the word called is, how it's used in the scriptures. That it is an invitation, that it is a summons, and it has a purpose behind those, either, either one of those other uh, two words that are used there. So invitation, summons, and purpose. So what does the word called mean? Some of the definitions that are applied to it, these are not the only ones, but these are the, uh, a couple that are pertinent to our study this morning. Invited as to a banquet. Appointed. Invited by God in proclamation of the gospel to obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom through Christ. One of the ways in which called is being used is when you had the great king who would have a banquet or a feast in his home. And he sent out invitations to other people. He was calling them to come to his house. Then the call went out that the feast was ready and the, the, everything had been prepared for them to now come to the feast that was being uh, provided for them. That's one of the ways in which it is used. Invited, and God has indeed invited us all. We know from those parables that Jesus would tell about those things, that Jesus is inviting all the creation to come into his kingdom, to come to the feast of the, of the lamb and his bride. But it's also used in the scriptures to talk about a summons. When we think about this, think about a policeman who gives you a ticket. That on the back of that ticket, it may have a summons for you to appear at a certain time and a certain date in court to defend yourself against something. That is the import of what this other term is speaking of. That you have been summoned by God to be somewhere or to do something. That is a very specific type of calling. That is one that many times we feel a little uncomfortable with and probably don't talk about as much as we should. But the scriptures use this in talking about all of Christians as well. There's other ways in which the word called is used in scriptures also, like when a person is called by a certain name. That's not what we're necessarily referring to this morning, but it would certainly be applicable as well. But what we are talking about is these two things. First is that invitation that we are invited by God to come. First understand that, that our holy God in heaven 
has invited us to come to him. An invitation has been extended. That is something that is beseeching you, that is begging you, that is entreating you, that is wanting and desiring for you to come to him. But the other way in which it is used in that summons is a directive. And many times it's because we have answered that first call that we now know that we have been called to be certain types of people. The context is what's going to tell you which way in which it is used. So let's go through a few, few points along these lines. First, we understand from the passage that was read for us in 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, that this is a calling that comes from God because not all invitations are the same. Some are a lot more important and carry a lot more weight than others. You know, an invitation to go and eat meatloaf to me is not going to be as good as an invitation to go eat some steak. It's just not going to be the same. Now, it may come from somebody who's very important, though. And because of the person who is inviting you is important, you may choose the meatloaf over the steak because of the person who's doing the inviting. And so we have to understand that when we think about the invitation that God is extending to us, that it is a holy calling. It is not one that originates with man, that both the person who is inviting and the thing that you are being invited to is much more important and greater than anything else and from anyone else you could ever comprehend. That when we think about the invitation that God is extending to us, it is not just an invitation to come and to enjoy his company. It's not an invitation that we have even a closer fellowship with other people. All of those are, are benefits, but that is not what we're being called to, and that is not what Paul is talking about here. In 2 Timothy, what Paul is talking to Timothy about is that Timothy, it seems, is desiring and even being tempted to go back into the world or maybe to forsake the way. That Paul is in prison, and he seems to understand that this is his last imprisonment and his life is going to end during this imprisonment. And so he's telling Timothy that he has to continue to fight. And he tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of me and don't be ashamed of the testimony that's been given to you. That you have been given a charge and a job and you need to keep a, a clear understanding of just how important that job is. The way in which you find yourself to not be ashamed and to be courageous enough to continue this fight is to first realize who it is who called you and what he called you to. That this is a holy calling. It is indeed separate from any other calling. It is distinct from any other calling. It is a calling that has nothing that is dark attached to it whatsoever. And so Paul tells Timothy that it is about Jesus Christ who before time began has now been revealed by the appearance of, of Jesus who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That that holy calling that Timothy had was to hold on to what had been committed to him and to continue to preach it to others because that was what was going to save others. You take this holy calling that you've received and you share that invitation with other people. Much like sometimes we may have something going on in our home and we may invite a few people and then we say, look, if you talk to somebody else or so-and-so or, or if you run into somebody else, invite them to come along too, that everybody's welcome. And that is what the gospel is all about, is an invitation that is open for all. In Hebrews 3 and verse 1, the Hebrew writer uses the very same reasoning when he says in chapter 3 and verse 1, therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling, that this is a call from heaven that the Hebrew brethren had received so that they would not shrink back, so that they would not give up on Christ, so that they would continue the course that they had been set on, that this calling comes from heaven above and not from man. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16, which is basically our, our theme verse for the year, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. When you see the way that Peter uh, terms that, he who called you, he who called you is holy, you also be holy. That in the Old Testament, when God said to Israel, be holy, for I am holy, that that was an invitation. That was a directive. They had been invited and they had been summoned. You come to me because I am a holy God and you be holy as I am holy. I don't know how holy God is if I do not first come to God and understand who God is. This is a heavenly, holy calling that's been given to us and nothing else compares to it whatsoever. Again, this is something that does not invite us to just something to be enjoyed or to fellowship with other people, but it's about being in fellowship with our God. How does it come? 
I think one of the things that we have to dispel from the very beginning is it's not some, something that's mystical. It's not something that you just kind of feel. It's not a near-death experience that you survived. It's nothing like that that we understand that God has called us. Well, he must have spared me for a greater purpose is sometimes what you hear people saying. As if God had a specific purpose behind everything that happens in life. And that is just simply not true. The Bible even tells us that time and chance happen to us all. And there are some things that are a result of our lack of wisdom or maybe our exercise of wisdom. And some of the things that we do well have some negative consequences attached to it. Some of the things that we have that we do that are bad have some positive consequences attached to it. But by none of those things can we tell whether or not God is approving of us or not by just the outcome. And so we need to understand that when we're talking about this calling, Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 2, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice what he says there, <clears throat> that you had been chosen before time began. Not you specifically, but you who have been called by the gospel and responded to it in belief and trust. That's the way in which we are called. God sends the invitation to everyone. There were specific people that were invited long ago, like the Israelites. And many of the Israelites did not respond to that call. And so in the parables that Jesus would tell about this, he says, now go out into the streets, the byways and the highway, go into the hedges, go to the places where the, the sick and the infirmed and the ashamed will actually hide, them places, hide uh, their faces from society and go even into those places and fill my house with guests. The invitation is given, but the invitation is this, the gospel. And as I said, it's a holy calling that you don't come to the feast and as it, as it is in the parable or the wedding, that you don't just wear whatever. You have the wedding garment. You have to be cleansed so that you can be part of that feast and that festival that was going on because it is God who gave this to you. He who called you is holy, so you therefore be holy. He has called you to the wedding, so wear the attire that he gave to you. Put on the new man that was created that way. When Paul says in Romans 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. It is not just two specific individuals that God picked out this person and that person and that person. But it is to everyone who believes, to the Jew or the Gentile, does not matter. Because it is the power of God. That invitation that's been given is an invitation for you to be changed. And on top of that, it is a summons that you must be changed. You cannot come to God and then leave the same way that you came. When you come to God, it must be that he has that power to change you, that power of salvation, and to make you what you need to be. If you are here this morning and you are waiting for God to call you, then wait no longer. Because the gospel message is calling you. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, it's put this way. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. We know then that as Jesus is constantly knocking, that that call is constantly going out, that people have each and every day an opportunity to respond to the gospel, that we know not everyone's going to open that door that not everyone's going to respond to that call. That call is only heard by specific individuals. Why did you open that door? There, I'm sure, especially around here, you, you probably have people walk through your neighborhood all the time and they're knocking on the door. And most of the time, if you know who it is is at the door and you think they're soliciting, you're, you may not open the door. There's a lot of things that try to gain access to your heart. There's things at work, there's things at school, there's things in your home, there's things through entertainment, there's things through whatever else you want to look at. And there's all these things that are trying to gain access to your heart that you're, that's constantly knocking. But you chose to not open the door to those things, but when Jesus knocked at that door of your heart, you opened it. Why? Why did you let him in? 
That's what I mean by this call is only answered by specific individuals. You knew that the person that was knocking at your heart had the answers for everything that was wrong and going on in your heart. You knew that you needed to listen to this person. And all these other things were trying to invade your heart, invade your home, because they were seeking to destroy it. They had their own interests. But Jesus was knocking at your heart for something totally different. It was for salvation. And so when Jesus says in Mark 2 and verse 17, that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The opinion that you had of yourself was this, I am sick and I am in need of help. And when that happens, we usually put out the call that we, we call for a doctor. We call for a physician. Jesus says that's what was going on with you, that you were calling for, for help. You were calling for healing. And the doctor showed up at the door. I'm not going to say he made a house call. But that's basically what it is. He called you, and you answered because you knew that he was right and everything in your life was wrong. And he was the only one that was going to be able to fix it. That's what Jesus is saying here. And those are the only ones who are going to listen to that call. Also in Matthew 11 and verse 28, Jesus sends out that same type of invitation when he says, come to me. He's calling for everybody who labors and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. The reason that we came to Jesus, the reason that we answered that call is because we felt that tremendous burden and weight of sin. We saw how it was weighing us down. We saw what it was doing to our lives. We saw how it was nothing but destructive. We understood what the end of it was, that it was eternal condemnation. We understood that, and that's not what we wanted. And Jesus says, you don't have to have that. Come to me, and I will give you rest. This quarter in our auditorium class, we're talking about the kind of peace that God gives to us and that calmness we should have in our soul. That gives you peace. That gives you calmness. Come to me and I will give you rest. Are you troubled? Going through the world that, you're, that we're living in, are you troubled by everything that's going on? Are you troubled when you see the way in which people interact with one another? Are you troubled about the way that you interact with other people? Are you troubled by worry and fret and fear and frustration? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He's knocking at the door. Open the door. When the scriptures are talking about being called through the gospel, that's that invitation that's being given to us. But as we also said, there's also a directive, a summons that's attached to it as well. In Romans 8, verses 28 through 30, we've also been called according to his purpose, which in essence is talking about salvation, but also the purpose behind that salvation. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. That is not talking about circumstances in life that you're going to find the best parking spot in the crowded parking lot or anything like that. What that is talking about is the good that's being spoken of is that your soul can be saved. That's what the verse is referring to. Because it says, to those who are called according to his purpose. God's purpose is not that you get that parking spot. God's purpose is that you be saved. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those he knew would be the sick. Those who are burdened and heavy laden that won't rest. Those are whom he foreknew. These are the one he predestined. And what he predestined was this, is that they can be conformed to the image of his son. That is the summons part of this passage. Being conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We see that whole process taking place in their lives. It is much like when you think about the priests of the Old Testament. And as we went through Leviticus at the beginning of the year, and we talked about the priesthood and some of their roles and responsibilities that they had, that not just anyone could be a priest, but to the ones who were called to be priests, there were certain duties and responsibilities that they were now called upon to do. Peter tells us that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the praises, uh, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He called us out of that darkness and into his light that we might be a nation of holy priests. And just as it was that the priests, when they were offering those sacrifices to God, they had to cleanse themselves. They had to put on their priestly garments. They had to uh, make sure that the items of the tabernacle were handled and used in a certain way and that they were cleansed and ready. They were to take the, the sacrifices and cut them up and burn them and do all these different things in very specific ways because that's what they had been called upon to do because they had been called to be priests. We have been called to be priests, and so now we have a specific calling that's been given to us to offer these sacrifices, the excellencies. We have been given that. The world, listen, the world does not have that right. You realize that? That right is not given to them. They've been called, but they have not answered. They've been called, but they have not become priests. They have been called, but they have not responded to the gospel. But because we have that right and also that duty has been given to us that we may proclaim the praises, those he justified, those he purified, those he glorified. You have been exalted to a position because of the fact that you have answered that call of God. That's amazing to me, that God would allow someone with unclean lips, as Isaiah said, to speak. And so God touched those lips with that burning coal and made it clean. Because you cannot take the word of God upon unclean lips and proclaim it. We have to be cleansed and we have to be made whole. In Ephesians 4 and verse 1, the expectation is this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. If you were in our class this morning, think about how many times we talked about how unworthy, how we cannot be worthy, and we are not worthy. And I amen every one of those statements. And yet the Bible still says walk worthy. That's what we were called to. That's what we aspire. That's what we push. And that's what we move ourselves to because we know that it is God who has cleansed us. And God who has made us ready and available to do those things and to answer that call that's been given to us. So back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there's a few things I want us to notice as we bring this to a conclusion. Because as we began in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we see that Paul is reminding Timothy to not be ashamed, to not be afraid, and to remember that holy calling that's been given to him. He continues that same type of, of logic and reasoning throughout the rest of this epistle. But I want us to notice some things as we get into chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and starting at verse 20, he talks about these different types of vessels. These vessels that you have in your house, some are for honor and some are for dishonor. So I want you to think about for just a moment, you've probably heard this illustration before. I want you to think about the dog's bowl. The bowl that the dog eats its food out of. What, is, what else is that bowl useful for? Would you use that same bowl to feed your family out of? To feed a governor out of? To feed the president out of? To feed a king out of? To feed the people in your house at Thanksgiving? Is that the bowl that you bring out for people to eat out of? Your famous mashed potatoes, do you serve it out of the dog's bowl? The thing about it is, is this, is that it's a bowl. It can be used for that. And this is what Paul is making the point of. You don't use that dog's bow because you know it's disgusting. You know it's not honorable. You know it's not respectful. You show no reverence by using that. But if, what if you were to clean it, overlay it with gold, change its appearance, cleanse it inside and out, has no resemblance to what it was before. What about then? And so what Paul is talking about is that you have all these vessels in a person's house, some for honor and some for dishonor. Do not be a vessel for dishonor. Do not present to God a dog's bowl. You present to God something that's fit for God. But this is the point. 
Only God can make that change. You can't do it without him. We can be prepared for every good work, for the master's use, if we answer the call that God has given to us. We don't have to be the dog's bowl any longer. We can be something much better. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and, and look back at verse 4, he gives several different reasons for this or, or how to, uh, to change our thinking about this process. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, he says this, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You have to see yourself as a soldier who has been enlisted. You, you, you have recruiters, and the recruiters go to the schools, and they say, hey, you know, you're a, you're a bright young man. Let me put you into the military where you can wear a uniform and live in a, in a hole for several months at a time. And young men do it. Why? Because it's challenging. There's an illustration that's used about there was the, the recruiters that all showed up at a high school, and they were giving their, their pitches to the senior class about why they should join the particular branch. And the, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force all got up there, and they gave their reasonings for all the different reasons why they should join that particular branch. And then the, the Marine stood up there in his dress blues, and he stood there silent for an entire two minutes and did not move. And at the end of the ten, two minutes, he said, I don't think there's anybody worthy here to be a Marine. And he went and sat down. Guess how many people showed up for him? Almost everybody. Because it made him different. You are a soldier. You've been enlisted. You don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this world. You are different. We think it's easy because we hear the sales pitch and everybody else wants to go along with the sales pitch. But God tells you, you are not worthy to be my child and yet I will make you worthy and deserving, and I will glorify you along with my son. Why did you open the door to Jesus? Because you wanted to be the same or because you wanted to be different? Why did you open the door? Because you want to continue to go along with the crowd or you want to be different? Why did you open it? Why did you enlist as a soldier. Since you did that, do not entangle yourself with all the different things of this world. Don't cheat. Verse 5, he says this, And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. There are times where people want to cheat in athletics or whatever else it is that are going on. Don't cheat God. You know what God is deserving of. You know what he is worthy of. You know the way in which you should act and react with God. Don't cheat. Don't cut corners. Don't allow for those things that says, oh, well, it's, it really doesn't matter. Don't settle for less. Don't cheat God. In the Old Testament, there were people who were offering animals, and God said, I wish somebody would bar the door and just make you stop it because you're not doing any of these things for me. You're not honoring me or respecting me. They were trying to cheat. God even says, you know, the tithes that I require, you're, you're not even offering those. And that's just simple mathematics, and they wouldn't do it. Don't cheat God out of what he's deserving of. Do the hard work. As he says in verse six, he talks about the farmer. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. God will reward you if you are the type of individual who's going to do the hard work like the farmer does. He gets up early, he stays up late, he prays for the rain, he prays for the sun, he is mindful and he's out there pulling the weeds, he's doing all the things that a hard worker is supposed to do. Don't try to skimp by without doing the hard work. As Christians, this is one of the things that is very easy for us to do. We become, we become lazy and stagnant, we forget what we've been called to be. We've been called to be hard workers. We've been called upon to sweat, to bleed for what we believe in. That doesn't sound like easy work. But why did you open the door? The hardworking farmer is the first to partake of the fruits. We do it because we know that it pleases our God first and foremost, but also we know the benefits that it has to mankind. We must be about the hard work. Verses 22 through 26, at the end of this chapter, he says this, Flee also youthful lusts. Here are some things to 